Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the good weather, sunshine that we are enjoying uh, both yesterday and today. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless now our service. Thank you for sending Christ to die for our sins. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us as we leave here today to cling even tighter to your promises. And I pray that you'll fill me with your spirit for the task this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I'm deviating from our normal series this morning to uh, bring kind of a, a mixture of a couple of messages I preached three years ago out of the book of Habakkuk. Um, and, and we'll be back into Matthew next week, but uh, I, I believe that, that uh, where we're at as a country and even as a community really, really, um, and as, as believers really necessitates this message this morning. Uh, on November 8th, our country will elect a new president, and I'm not going to tell you who to vote for today. I'm, that's, that's beyond the scope of... Of, uh, of what I'm going to do this morning. I'm not going to tell you who not to vote for today either. I think most people know my opinion and I'm going to keep my opinion to myself as much as possible in the pulpit. Uh, my purpose is not to focus on November 8th. I want to speak to you this morning about November 9th. All right. Uh, on November 8th, something big will happen in our country. And on November 9th, we're going to have to continue living uh, living for the Lord and, and going to work and, and, uh, and, and uh, maybe hopefully mending relationships that we may have damaged in the discourse in the, in the um, months leading up to this. But on November 9th, all the votes will be cast by both the living and the dead. Amen. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure who's going to outnumber who, but our country, uh, may, our country may be, uh, and I say that as a joke, but our our country may be on the brink of disaster. Of course, we hear this every four years, so I don't know. But uh, our country may be on the on the brink of disaster. Uh, and I and I say that as I say that, please believe me. I'm not saying that flippantly. I have three children, and I have to think about uh, what their future is going to be. And uh, it's one thing to think about your own future, but to think about that for your children is, is goes to a whole new level. But uh, it, it could be a d disaster from which our country may never recover. I mean, that's, that's possible. This could be the end of America as we know it. Will God allow that? Will God allow, would God allow America to be destroyed, even conquered by a foreign army or, or, uh, or taken over from within? God has blessed America like no other nation in history. I know that's cliche to say, but it's true. I mean, I never really realized it as much as when we went to Bolivia this summer. <laughs> and we went to Bolivia. Bolivia was nice. It was wonderful. But man, when we got back to that Miami airport, I could not wait for some American culture and some, uh, you know, just, just to be back in, in a, such a blessed country. America has been the bastion of freedom and liberty. America has been a sanctuary for those who would come and seek freedom. America has sent missionaries and is still sending missionaries with the gospel of Jesus Christ across the globe. And if, American, if America fails, will freedom and liberty survive in this world? I mean, I mean, if America goes down the tubes, where can we escape to? There is no continent beyond that we can get on a bunch of pilgrim vessels and sail to, as they did in the 15 and 1600s, right? There's nowhere else to go. Shall we go to Canada? It's too cold up there to be free. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, there's nowhere else to go. Amer if America fails, who will send missionaries to places where Christ has not yet been named? Yet America needs revival. We are a nation that slaughters babies by the millions. We are a nation that gives itself over to every type of sexual deviance. We are a nation of violence and pagan godlessness. We are a nation now anymore of riots and, and lawlessness. We are a nation where kneeling in prayer to celebrate a touchdown is forbidden, yet kneeling during the national anthem is applauded. 
We are a nation of racial tension and division. We can't ignore that. We are a nation of political fraud. We are a nation uh, that has turned its back on God and we need revival more than anything. We need revival more than we need a political party. Either one of them. We need revival and we pray for it. What does revival look like? If we were to have revival in America today, would it be what you want? Would it be what I want? Or do we have something else in mind? Would it mean more church attendance? Would it mean bigger meetings? Would it mean certain political policies being advanced in America? What would, re what would revival look like? What, here's a more important question. What would it take to bring revival to America? And I think that is the crucial question. Uh, it, what is the event that God needs to work to bring us as a nation to the place where we will actually turn our eyes on God? What will it take for God to turn my eyes on Him exclusively? And I want to throw in the caveat here, and I probably will at the end too, I am not preaching this morning to tell you to stay home and not vote. All right? that, I don't believe that is what God has in mind for Christians either. I think you ought to go vote. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for or against, but I believe as a Christian we have those responses. We, we have a privilege, really. Most Christians, most Christians throughout history have not had the, the uh, freedom to go and vote for their leaders, so we have that responsibility and great privilege. But have you ever wondered why God allows our country to continue in, in sin and in idolatry and immorality and murder and all of the things that are... It just seems like it's all coming to a head now. Have you ever wondered, have you ever prayed for revival in our country and at the same time wondered why God doesn't seem to bring it? Real revival though, not just big meetings or a special week or... I'm talking about... I'm talking about revival where the fabric of the nation is shaken. A, 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 great, a great awakening. We think about the great awakening. Hey, that was back in the 1700s, right? People had good reason to be spiritual back then. They didn't have as much cool stuff as we do. You know, America before the great awakening was just as bad as it is now. They just didn't have Twitter to talk about it. I mean, they were, they were evil. They, they had rejected God. And they were living like it. And God still had the power to bring a revival, even with the wicked king of England <laughs> taking away everybody's freedom. And yet it happened. When you look, though, at our nation's moral decay, do you ever just want to ask the Lord, why are you allowing this, God? I have. There are still many good Bible-believing Christians in this land, and yet the Lord... The, the, the country, Lord, seems to, seems to hate you. This country is sold out to wickedness. Lord, why do you allow this to happen? How long are you going to let it go on, God, before you step in and judge and set things right? Have you ever wanted to ask God that question? If you have, you're not out of line. You're, you're, that's not a lack of faith question. That's a... That's a question that Christians ask their God. That is, uh, it, you should not be ashamed to go to God and ask Him a, a question like that. Certainly the prophet Habakkuk was not ashamed to ask God that question. In fact, H Habakkuk was a different type of pro prophet. He, he came to God with a question. Most prophets address themselves and their messages to a certain target audience um, and to a group of people. For instance, Nahum addressed himself and his message to the to the a prophecy against Nineveh, um, Isaiah mainly addressed himself to Jerusalem and Judah. Hosea directed his prophecy toward the northern kingdom of Israel and Samaria, but not Habakkuk. His message wasn't directed toward any group of people. Habakkuk's target audience was God, God Himself. In short, the book of Habakkuk. Uh, here we find the prophet speaking only to God, addressing himself. To absolutely nobody else but Jehovah. And what was Habakkuk's message? Well, he didn't have a message. What? A prophet with no, 
uh, with, with no target audience and, and no group of people to speak to and no message? What kind of a prophet is this guy? Habakkuk didn't have a message because what he had was questions. You see, Habakkuk lived in the land, land of Judah, most likely in Jerusalem, sometime around uh, 612 to 589 B.C. Uh, at that time, the northern kingdom of Israel had already been wiped out by the Assyrian Empire. They had been carried off into pagan captivity a hundred years earlier. Judah had seen a succession of evil and idolatrous kings. Hey, they had some pretty bad, pretty bad leaders. They, they did experience a, a little bit of revival under King Josiah, but King Josiah had just died in battle with Pharaoh Necho of Egypt. And when he died in battle, his sons carried on their grandfather's wickedness. And now Jehoiakim was king of Judah. This king was especially evil. This is the king to whom Jeremiah gave a prophecy. And it was in a scroll. And, and Jehoiakim heard a little bit of it read to him. And he grabbed it and he cut it up with a knife and he threw it in the fire. That's what he thought about God's word. This is the same Jehoiakim who murdered Urijah the prophet because he didn't like Urijah's message. When God wrote the epitaph of Jehoiakim in 2 Chronicles 36, he characterized this king's works as all abominations. Judah was a wicked society given over to immorality, idolatry, greed, violence and oppression in Habakkuk's day. The leadership of this country was totally corrupt. God, a good people, godly people were grieving at what was going on in their country, but they seemed powerless to affect it. They, they couldn't do anything about it. Events just seemed to keep crashing onward and onward no matter how hard they prayed and how much they cried. The corrupt king and his henchmen seemed to be getting away with everything they wanted to do. Does that sound familiar, by the way? Um, but uh, anyway, this was the way things were when Habakkuk addressed himself to God with questions. And he asked God, why? Why is this going on? So I want you to look in Habakkuk chapter 1. We're going to get into a little bit later passage, but for background, I want you to see Habakkuk's question, his complaint in Habakkuk chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse 1, and uh, here's what it says, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou will not hear, even cry unto thee of violence, and thou will not save, why dost thou not show, or why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass the, about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. You see his complaint? God, how are you letting this go on? There's, there's violence in the land, there's spoilers, plundering, there's theft going on in the land before me. How can you make me look at this, God? The law is, doesn't apply to everyone equally. And because of that, wrong judgment goes forth. That's his, and his question is, God, why don't you do something about this? I tell you what, I've felt this question for many years. <laughs> And I've, I don't know if I've ever felt it more than I've felt it this year. God answers Habakkuk in the next verse. He says, Behold ye among the heathen. This is God's answer to Habakkuk. And regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from far and they shall fly as the eagle that hasteneth to eat. Listen to this. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the 
east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. You see what happened here? Habakkuk asked God why he was allowing so much evil and injustice to penetrate and perpetrate their, their society. And, and uh, what was God's answer to that question? Well, God said, don't worry, Habakkuk. I'm going to bless and raise up, up a bunch of people who are ten times worse than you in your country, more wicked, and they're going to come, and they're going to conquer and destroy and to torture and enslave your country. Don't worry, Habakkuk. I got this covered. Does that sound fun? Habakkuk was blown out of the water by this. It'd be like saying, God, please save America. And God says, don't worry, I'm raising up ISIS to come in and take over everything. What would your answer to that be? It's about the same thing here, all right? Habakkuk was blown out of the water. He didn't expect that type of answer from God. Instead of settling the problem in his mind, the Lord's answer only raised another question. God's answer provided another why in the prophet's mind. God wasn't acting like God. Not the God he knew. This is not how you're supposed to act, Lord. You're not supposed to make the, the worst people win. At least, you know, we're bad, but we're not that bad. These guys were, the, the Chaldeans were bad news. They, they were not nice people. I mean, you don't go around conquering and torturing and killing everybody and be nice people, right? And so God was not acting like God to Habakkuk. This morning is my desire for us to see what we must do when God doesn't act like God. When He doesn't act like the God we know. When, he doesn't, uh, when, when God does not act like God, what should we do? What should be our response to that? How do we handle it? When God does not act like the God you know, here's how we handle it. Then trust Him and get to know Him better. When God doesn't act like God, then maybe we need to trust Him and, and learn more about Him and adjust our expectations of Him and get to know Him and serve Him and love Him better. In other words, we must live by faith. This morning, I want to take a journey here with Habakkuk through expectation, confusion, doubt, disappointment, and then faith. And we will see that, uh, that we view the Lord a lot of times in our own way, and that God is not obligated to be who we want Him to be and to do what we want Him to do. He will, uh, we're going to conclude this morning by discovering what we should do when God doesn't fit into our little box. And I'll tell you this morning, He doesn't fit into my little box. Because I had everything planned out, you know. I had everything the way it's supposed to be, and it's not that way. Other than the Cubs making it finally to the World Series. I'm not even a Cubs fan. I'm just, I'm becoming one, I think, just by watching this. But So let's look at Habakkuk's next question. And that's in chapter 1 and verse 12. All right, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 12. Here he is talking to God. Art? Thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my Holy One. We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment, and, O mighty God, Thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore, lookest Thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest Thy tongue, when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? And make us men as the fishes of the sea and as creeping things, that they have no ruler over them. They take up all them with the angle. They catch them in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice unto their net and burn incense unto their drag. Because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? What a question. I also want to look at chapter 2 and verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set 
me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And we'll look at that in a, in a moment. What is God doing in America? He doesn't seem to be acting like God. I grew up in the 80s. I'm a child of the 80s, the greatest decade. The greatest amount of clashing colors. Hot pink and black and aquanet and big hair and Ronald Reagan, amen. And uh, when I grew up in the 80s, everybody loved America. You know that? Even the communists seemed to like America in the 80s. They were afraid not to. And uh, I mean, it was, I, I grew up, when I was in, I remember in, in kindergarten, man, we were just, we, we would play soldiers and, and, and all that stuff. And it wasn't G.I. Joe, it was the USA against the Russians, right? The Russians were always coming. And, uh, and it was against, you know, that's how we played. I mean, it's just America, America, America. Everything was great. Um, and, and, and so I grew up with that, you know. My formative years were not, some of you, bless your, your hearts, your formative years were the 60s. And I don't know how you're, you're even sane right now. Um, and and uh, maybe, maybe you don't remember the 60s. Maybe some of the things you did caused you not to remember the 60s. I don't know. But, but none of this is in my notes. I'm sorry. I should stick to the notes. But um, What is God doing in America, though? Because on November 9th, Whoever is elected president, I have no confidence. I mean, I just don't. And, and one in particular is, if that person is elected president, I know what's going to happen. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. Unless God steps in and, I mean, I mean everything's open. God could step in and, and do some kind of weird miracle and nothing anybody expects can happen. <clears throat> I hope so. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's, that's, that's my prayer, but what are we going to do on November 9th? God doesn't seem to be acting like God. The bad guys are winning. That's how we used to think of it as children, you know. The bad guys never win, right? They're never supposed to win. Well, the bad guys seem to be winning. When God does not act like God, He doesn't act like the God you know, then trust Him. Get to know him better. If you, if you remember nothing from this message other than that thing about the 60s, then remember this, all right? When God does not act like the God you know, then trust him and get to know him better. How do we do this? How do we put this into practice? First of all, evaluate your, your expectations of God. Take a, take a self-inventory and, and see what are my expectations of God and, and how, how tightly do I hold to them. Evaluate your expectations of God. Look at verse 12 in the, in the first part of the verse. The prophet says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, mine Holy One? We shall not die. And look at verse 13. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. Thou canst not look on iniquity. Here are some expectations that the prophet has of God. God, you can't approve of this. This is not what I know of you. Our expectations of the Lord are based upon what we know of Him. Right? When you go to McDonald's and order a Big Mac, you have some expectations. And those expectations might involve two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, and onions on a sesame seed bun. <laughs> I worked there for two years as a teenager. I know. You know all that because of the information you have been given. Your, your expectations are not without a proper basis. Now, when you open up that box, all that stuff may be in various places. I mean, it's not always looking like it does in the picture. but um, And see, even so, our expectations about the Lord are not baseless. They are, they are founded on knowledge, on what He has revealed to us. And Habakkuk's expectations of God were based on truth. He's, he's not way off base here. Um, and and uh, he expected God... In, in verse 12, to be unchanging and, and eternal. 
Oh God, you're from everlasting. You're unchanging. You're eternal. And now it looks like you've changed. And he expected God to be holy and separate from sin. And he says, Oh God, you're of purer eyes than to behold sin. You, you, can't, you, you can't look on this with approval, with approval in verse 13 to behold, to look on something here. And the way he's using it means to look on it with approval. Obviously God is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He sees every evil act that takes place. It's not like God is up in heaven and he sees someone say a cuss word and he covers his eyes and plugs his ears and says, no, 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 I didn't hear that. All right, that's not what God is doing. And what, what Habakkuk is saying is, God, you're holy and you can't approve of sin. This is what I know of you, God. You can't approve of this. And here comes Nebuchadnezzar. Here comes the Chaldeans. And they're an invading army. And when they, when they attack a, a, a city, they, they lay a siege around it. When they, when they break that siege, they torture and kill people. I won't describe some of it. I thought about it just for a moment, and I'm not going to do it. It, it would be worse than any horror movie you have ever seen. I don't care what ones you've seen. It's worse than all of them put together. You've heard some things out of the Middle East about the evils that are done in the name of, of ISIS and, and the Taliban and all those things. It's worse than that, what they would do. Because it wasn't publicity stunts as much. It was just, hey, let's kill people. All right, so that the next town will surrender. And so what Habakkuk is saying is, God, you're holy. What I know of you, you can't approve this. And God has just said, I'm going to raise these people up and I'm going to make this happen. This is of me. And Habakkuk say, no, it isn't. You can't approve this, God. He expected God to act with the utmost mercy toward His people. God would never raise up these kind of people. Do we have the same expectations of God? Evaluate your expectations this morning. What are your expectations of God? Our eternal, unchanging, and holy God. We know that's what He is. Uh, our Father of lights who loves us and gave His Son for us who cannot approve of sin. We know this of Him. We expect God's blessings and comfort and protection. All of this is based on truth. We expect God to fight for right and curse wrong in our society, right? We expect God to defeat ISIS, to stop the baby killers in our government from being elected, to save the Supreme Court, to restore family and biblical values. Can God allow these things to go unchecked in America? Will He? We can take all these expectations of God and wrap them up into one general, to borrow the phrase from Charles Dickens, one great expectation. All right, And that is this. We expect that things must work out pleasantly for us. We expect that if God loves us, things will always go well. Now, I'm not saying that things are definitely not going to go well. I don't know. But, the, but uh, we, we have this expectation that the bad guys are supposed to lose and the good guys are supposed to win. That always happens. But if you... Pull out a history book and just read a little bit. It's never happened that way with a couple of exceptions. And fortunately, actually, not fortunately, but by God's providence, we have lived in one of those exceptions all of our lives. And I think we've come to think we deserve it for some reason. We need to evaluate our ex expectations of God. They do have a basis in truth, but are they binding upon God? Does he have to do it the way I want him to? There is a danger in our expectations of God. What is that danger? The danger is that God can defy our expectations. If you're all wrapped up in expectations and God defies them, what's going to happen to your faith? God, you have failed. No, he has failed your expectations, but he has not failed. The danger is God can defy your expectations. So guess what? Maybe we should just expect God to defy our expectations. Ex just, just 
put that into our, our psyche, our mindset, that God can and will defy our expectations. We like it when He does that in blessing. And He does. God, God sometimes blesses, and, and you say, wow, I didn't see that coming. It's wonderful. This bill was taken care of, or, or this disease was healed, or, or uh, some, somebody in my family got saved, or something like that. It's like, God, I wasn't expecting it. What a blessing. We love those defyings of the expectations. So let's expect God to defy our expectations. In verse 12, again, the second part of the verse or, O oh Lord, Thou hast ordained them for judgment. Who has He ordained to judge who? Well, God has ordained the Chaldeans to judge His people, Judah. O oh, mighty God, Thou hast established them for correction. Who has He established to correct who? He's established the Chaldeans to correct Judah. Okay? Verse 13. Thou art of pure eyes, then to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and behold, and holdest thy tongue, when the wicked devoureth a man that is more righteous than he? Uh, God defied Habakkuk's expectations, big time. He's blown out of the water here. Uh, Habakkuk expected God to choose, basically, to steal a term that we use in politics, the lesser of two evils. And, uh, and, and I have gone to the, to the polls many times and chosen the res lesser of two evils, and I still do that. You know, I, still, I still look at, hey, you know, weigh some of this stuff out, and, and which one's going to do the less damage, and, 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 and uh, we, we do that. Well, we're human beings. God doesn't do that. Uh, and and uh, here, here comes... Habakkuk, and he says, I expected, you know, I know we're bad, but they're worse. Uh, that's his argument, all right? They're bad. We're bad, I know. And we want revival, but they're worse. You can't do this. This is an argument between a man and God. And it's put it in Scripture for us to behold, because we, we argue the same things. <clears throat> he says, punish Judah, Lord, but don't do it that way. And the prophet became frustrated. His frustration and confusion boiled over into a question. Lord, if you are unchanging and holy, if you are so pure, you cannot approve of evil in any way, how can you look on silently and hold your tongue as these wicked Chaldeans devour Judah, who is not nearly as bad as, as, as we are? Raising the Chaldeans up, defy, they, they, they defied Habakkuk's expectation. Of, of his unchanging character and of his holy essence. He says, God, if you don't change and you're holy, how can this be? The Chaldeans conquering Judah would be to Habakkuk like God allowing a thousand 9-11 events in America. I mean, if you could imagine ISIS swarming our country and beheading people and, and conquering and taking over our government and imposing Sharia law and doing all it. If you can imagine that, that's what it would be like. In fact, it would be worse because they packed them all up and took, carried them all off as slaves. If God would do that to His chosen people, Israel, is America God's chosen people? No. Is America even in the Bible? No. It's not in the book of Revelation. We're not guaranteed to exist tomorrow. So the Chaldeans conquering Judah would look what they do. Here he describes what's going to happen. Maybe he knew something of this army. He'd heard reports of how they had been conquering other countries. Verse 14. And and makest them as this is what they do. They make men as fishes of the sea and as creeping things that have no ruler over them. Um, and and take up all of them with the angle and catch them in their net and gather them in the drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. He's saying, look, they treat men like fish. How do you treat fish, you fishermen? You hook them, right? You net them. You throw them in your little well, then you fillet them and you eat them. In other words, you're not really all that concerned for their well-being. Those fish in your mind exist. And by the way, I love fishing, so I'm not condemning that. But uh, Those fish in your mind, they exist as something just for your benefit. Other than that, you don't care how much pain they feel or 
whatever. You don't care. It says, God, this is how they're going to treat us. Verse um, 16, therefore, and he says, here's what's going to happen, Lord, if you allow that to happen. They sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their drag. And because by them their portion is fat and their meat is plenteous. And so he says, look, God, um, since, uh, since they are able to do this, they are not crediting you, Lord. They are actually crediting a false god. They are they're offering sacrifices to their net and to their drag net. And, they're, and, and so they're, they're worshiping, they're actually ascribing this victory to their pagan belief system. You kind of like saying, hey, Lord, if you allow, if you allow um, a Muslim country to conquer America, they're going to give Muhammad credit. They're going to give Allah credit. And would you allow that to happen to your name, God? That's, that's kind of what he's saying here, okay? Um, his description of the Chaldean conquest reveals a time without mercy. Have you ever gone through a period of time where God just blows your expectations of him out of the water? Are you going through a time like that now? Don't let it shake your faith in God. We have expectations of God, but sometimes God defies those expectations, and that can be the danger of it. So we have to expect that. We have to, we have to um, plan on that almost, if that's possible. When he doesn't act like the God that we know, what should we do then when this happens, when God does not act like God? What, what do we boil that down to? Well, maybe this. Acknowledge God's truth over your own expectations of Him. Elevate God's truth, what He reveals of Himself. Elevate that over your expectations. In other words, say, God, you do your thing. You be God and help me to accept that. Instead of walking around saying, God, you're not doing it right. This is what you're supposed to be. Now get back down here and do this. All right? I've been in option B for many, many, many Many years. I mean, that's just part of being an idiot, I guess. But um, anyway, uh, acknowledge God's truth over your expectations of Him. That's what Habakkuk does here. He he argues this out with God, and then in in chapter two, we're going to see him settle the matter in his own heart. Look how he settles it in verse one: "I will stand upon my watch." and set me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Look at verse 4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Habakkuk here sets a great example for us. He says, I'm going to stand on my watch. Prophets did not get a constant stream of revelation from the Lord, they couldn't pull out like heavenly Twitter and say, all right, God, give me 144 characters for this situation, you know. Uh, they didn't get text messages from God on a constant basis, but they did from time to time get a vision from the Lord. But when, when it had been a while, the prophet who was burdened for his people, uh, he, he may retire from from public life for a while and just seek the Lord in meditation and prayer and, and ask God for a vision. This is what Habakkuk did. He says, I'm going to watch and see what the Lord has to say to me. I'm going to shut up now and I'm going to listen to God. That's what he's saying. He says, I'm going to stand upon my watch here. This figure of speech uh, hearkens to uh, a watchman standing in the tower, the turrets of a city, looking for invading armies or, or approaching friends uh, to see what's going on. That's his attitude of expectation. And he says, uh, and I'm going to see what's what answer is going to happen when I am, what, what God's going to say when I'm reproved or when I'm corrected. And uh, he decided to reserve judgment at this point on the Lord's actions, even though he was frustrated and even though he didn't understand. See, uh, God doesn't necessarily need me to understand for him to proceed. Um, and so Habakkuk realized that too. And he, he, uh, it, he expects the Lord to reprove him. He says here in, in verse 1, he says, um, and see, uh, let's see, see what he'll say to me and what I may answer when I am reproved, corrected. You know, God's going to correct me here. Um, 
He expects the Lord to reprove him, to challenge his thinking and change his mind. He says, I'm waiting, Lord. I'm holding my tongue until you explain to me what I do not understand. And if I never understand, I am going to live by faith. Are you willing to learn something new about the Lord? If you never learn anything new about Him, do you actually grow in your knowledge of Him at all? To have your mind changed by His word or His actions? To have your vision of Christ broadened or your relationship with the Savior deepened? Are you willing to acknowledge God's truth over your expectations of Him? That's the question I put to me this morning. Then are you willing to live by faith? Are you willing, if, if you're willing to do this, you're, you're willing to live not for November 8th, but for November 9th. I'm not saying, uh, hey, on November 8th, I'm going down here and voting, God willing, all right? I'm not saying stay home. But I'm saying trust God. Not, God's not on the ballot. He's a write-in candidate, but uh, he's, he's, not on the, he's not on the ballot. So you can trust him no matter what because he's not going to lose the election. Even dead people can't vote him in or out. He's already in. And instead of wringing our hands, we'll be able to say, what an exciting time it is to be alive and to see what great things God can do. Even if, even if the, a person who despises Christ is in office. Or if people in the Supreme Court will take away our rights. And I don't want that, by the way. I'm not, I don't, I don't want to I don't want to pull uh, an Apostle Peter here and say, Lord, I'll never forsake you. No, I'll go to the death with you. I don't want to be one of those guys that stands up and brags about how awesome it's going to be to suffer persecution or anything like that. I don't want any of that. All right? This is not bravado here. <laughs> um, but I, I pray and Ask God to help us stand strong. Because I don't know what He's doing. Honestly, I've, I have no idea what God is doing. I'm not going to lay out here a, a vision of, here God's going to make this and this and this happen, and, and this could happen. We try to prophesy something. No, I, I have no clue what God is doing. But I do know this, that God is faithful. Amen. Let me be very clear. I, uh, I, I'm not sitting home. I'm, I'm going to go vote. Christians ought to do their best to vote. That, that, that's a privilege. But what I'm saying is as the psalmist said, he sums up Habakkuk's knowledge, his new gained knowledge here very well. In Psalm 118, verses 8 and 9, he says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. That's not just men, that's leaders. All right? And uh, when Ro Ronald Reagan was in office and when George Washington was in office and even with Barack Obama in office or whoever else is going to take office, there's really no real confidence you can put in a leader or in, in, a, in, a, in a president or Supreme Court or appellate courts. Or, you ought to vote. You ought to vote for godly leaders. That's, that's what I believe. But I have no idea what God's doing here. And so I think the best thing to do is say, Lord, we'll trust you. And then ask God as the prophet asks in chapter 3. O oh Lord, in verse 2, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. Aren't we all? O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known. In wrath, remember mercy. He didn't know what God was doing. I mean, he knew. He, he knew his nation was going to be conquered. He just didn't know why. I don't know that our nation's going to be conquered. Hey, everything could turn right around and be great. I hope so. When God does not act like the God you know, then trust him and get to know him better. That's what we got to do. And when this is the case, then on November 9th, we can't lose. Let's stand together.